welcome back, as the case may be. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor James White, who's a fellow of the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado at Boulder. If you were with us last night, I'm sure you enjoyed his talk, Sustainability, Climate Change, and You, more for the general audience. When we invited Jim, we also asked him to do a more technical talk on his research, which is what we have planned for tonight. Professor White's areas of research include modeling the global carbon cycle, development of techniques for measuring isotope ratios and atmospheric gases, reconstructions of paleo-environmental conditions, and, and tracing of groundwater flow and return. He has been a member of several deep ice core projects, ice coring projects in Greenland and Antarctica. His ice core research has helped to show that large climate changes tend to occur in the natural systems as abrupt and rapid shifts rather than slow and gradual adjustments to changing external conditions. Tonight he's going to tell us about his work in his about this work in his talk, Ice Core Stories, Abrupt Climate Change and the Future Sea Levels. Please help me greet Professor White. Thank you, Chuck. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone. I, I've met uh, a bunch of you uh, over the last two days, a day and a half. Is that day and a half? I remember. Um, it's been a, a lot of fun. Uh, I thank Chuck. I thank all of you for inviting me to come here and speak and spend some time with you. Uh, you've got a bunch of really fantastic students here. Uh, and you've got a wonderful place to have. So uh, thank you. And uh, hopefully this evening we can have some fun with this topic and uh, move on. Um, a new button. Yeah, I found you found it on your phone. Um, so uh, <coughs> I want to have to give more of a technical talk. I sort of tried to balance technical here because um, we can go deep into weeds. Um, stabilized co geochemistry. And would you like to do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I got at least one member of the audience who says that's not good. So, but I, I will try to get a little more into it than, than what I did last time. But uh, if at any point along the way I say something and you go, you know, hold on, that, that, that's not making it for me, raise your hand and, and we'll stop for a moment and, and back up and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so I work in ice cores. Uh, I started working ice cores uh, a long time ago, 30 years ago. Um, I'm not really fond of the cold. so. I haven't actually been you know, really happy the last day and a half. But I can tell you, it was even colder in Boulder, believe it or not, than when I left. Uh, and um, we spent some good time today talking about it. Ironically, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, who's also on the Polar Research Board with me, Jennifer Francis, has a theory that um, a lot of these cold outbreaks are actually the result of global warming. So it's called the Arctic Paradox. I'm not even going to try to explain it. <laughs> Put that in the back of your head. Right. Um, I thought I'd start with some pictures. So what is it like to be an ice core site? Um, we travel uh, from Schenectady, New York, to this is a picture of Kangarusuak, Greenland. That's the topography around here. Not in trees. There were trees, but they were all got cut down. Um, so there's not, it's, it's pretty barren. It's tundra. There's muskox. Muskox are um, basically large, sort of like hairy cattle with bad attitudes. <laughs> and they do have a bad attitude. They, they do not want to mess with them. They leave behind wonderful fur uh, that you can make absolutely fantastic sweaters out of, but you really don't want to get anywhere near them to get that fur off of them. You want to pick it off, bushes and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, this, this is a uh, C-130 we fly in the uh, uh, New York Air National Guard does the flying, U.S. Air Force. You see the skis here? And so when it lands on pavement, the skis are up a little bit. When we land on snow, these skis come down, and we can land and take off. Um, it's always exciting to land and take off in these things because uh, one, of the, one of the interesting reasons is that um, if you've ever been, you, I guess I was about to say, if you've ever been skiing, where am I, right? Um, you know that skiing on drier, powdery snow, not only do you get you know, better downhill, but also better cross-country. What we're 
course, you've been seeing in Greenland over the last 20 years is more and more wet conditions. And these planes have trouble. So we actually fly at night. And night is the, you know, the sun comes up and the fall goes down in the spring. So it's not really night. But it does get darker. It does get cooler uh, during the sort of traditional nighttime hours. So uh, we've been started to fly and, and do our work at night. Um, this is what it's like on the inside of the plane. You'll notice a couple of things. Everybody has earplugs. Uh, there is, I mean, the sound insulation inside of a military aircraft is like goose fly. Um, it is loud. Uh, it is so loud that if you wanted to have a conversation sitting next to somebody, you couldn't do it anyway. So um, it doesn't really bother you that there's no movie, uh, there's no, there's no service. <laughs> um, the uh, this canvasy thing back here is hiding the uh, the loo. So if you got to do something that's pretty much are out there with everybody else. I have no clue what this guy's doing right here. They just let you down to fly. Uh, this is what it's like flying into a camp. Uh, you can see the, uh, the runway is running like this. Uh, we have to, this is the, uh, um, this is where the drilling, the drilling's done out here underneath the snow. This was the, uh, our home called the Dome. I'll show you more pictures of that. You see tents out here. This is where we live. Uh, this is another place where we live. But we sp have to spread everything out because the way the snow Blows. Uh, if you put everything close together, you will get big drifts, and you can't do that. And so, what we do is we tend to space everything out. But that means you walk a lot, uh, and you're already in, in like the high of the day is maybe negative 20, so you're already pounding out calories just to stay warm, and you've got to walk on top of that. Uh, and we do work below the snow surface because when it does warm up, we don't want to mess with the ice core. So, what we do is we dig into the snow, cover it over with a uh, roof and then uh, work down in the snow. So the mean annual temperature is what you'd be working in. And the mean annual temperature is about negative 30 C. So it doesn't really matter at that point whether it's C or F. It's cold. <laughs> uh, this is the, uh, on the ground here. Um, the, uh, it, cool, the, the, uh, as the plane lands, they open up the back of it. And they do what's called the cargo combat offload. So there's some cargo, they just, uh, um, unhook un the pallets, which are on the floor there, and everybody gets out of the way, and they, they call for the pilot gun and plane. The pilot guns the plane and the pallet goes right out the back. And that's when you hope that you packed your scientific equipment really well. Uh, because you have to be able to get rid of to Any scientific equipment you bring up there, unless you specifically label it uh, fragile, is it may get into a combat offload, in which case it could get bounced around. So we've had some equipment broken. Um, this is a typical day. Um, it, the wind blows, uh, you can have total whiteout conditions at the surface and then look straight up and you see blue sky, just because of the wind. I mean, this is, as you know, you live in a place that's flat. And uh, when the wind starts cranking, there's really nothing that stops it. Here we don't even have the trees to break it out. So there's no boundary layer at all, it's like, you know, just wind. Um, that's probably the one thing that drives you most crazy after a while, is you just, you know, would you quit blowing, please? It won't. Uh, there are some pretty days, and note the flag here is indicating that the wind is still blowing. Uh, this is what it's like under the surface. This was a, at a place called North Grip. This has been, we've been here for about three years at this point. You see the roof we put over the hole. You also see that after a while it fails. And so this was actually kind of cool here for the entire last season. The roof kept sweating and hauling people in and out. Uh, the OSHA does not exist. <laughs> um, anyway, you sort of see that the uh, it's not a very good picture, but the drill is lying in here, and the drill is just blowing strings of stuff that goes in and out of the hole and, and drills ice core all day long. You see there's some wet spot stuff on the floor. It's the drill fluid. It's uh, pretty, pretty spartan. We don't really jazz this up very much. We're here to get ice core done to really you know, enjoy ourselves. Uh, here's a picture of an ice core that's just got the light coming through. It's kind of a cool shot. Uh, this is a... Uh, an ice core, this is the bottom of uh, the uh, North Grip ice core. And this is when we started to get rock. This is the first sign of you've gotten to the bottom of the ice sheet and you start to get rocks and pebbles in there from the bottom of the ice sheet. Typically, we stop there. If there's any electrical engineers in the room, you know that when we make contact with the bed, suddenly we have ground <coughs> that we never had before. And so all of your electronic equipment goes So you really don't want to hit ground unless you have to. Um, this picture is here for several reasons. Uh, one is, um, you get, and we talked about this with the students, uh, one of the cool things is you can contact all 
the clothing manufacturers and you say, would you either give me for free or at a deep discount some of your stuff? So we contact North Face and Go Light and uh, you know, all sorts of companies. And what you get is what they can't sell, <laughs> which I have on right here. And we got the nice red pants with a blue jacket. Uh, and the, the purple hat, my wife particularly hates the purple hat, but I particularly love the purple hat. It's been with me for about 30 years, and I, I will not get rid of the purple hat. The other thing that this points out is that everybody gets a lousy job. So my job this day, and I spent about eight hours doing it, was these are actually uh, fuel barrels. Um, that fuel in them that we would refuel uh, twin otters, the small aircraft that would come in and out. And there's a hand crank that you fill them up, but you can't get that last little bit out of the barrel with the hand crank. And so somebody, being me, got to go out there, unscrew them, and dump all the little bits into one barrel. And so I spent the day soaked in, in uh, jet fuel A, um, despite the fact that this is not beer. <laughs> it is jet fuel A. And so I'm just sitting here enjoying the day. Um, so everybody gets a lot of <coughs> my day to get a particularly lousy job emptying the latrine of the other jobs I don't want. Uh, and getting out is always exciting. So, so um, these are something called JADOs, or Jet Assisted Takeoff. And um, <coughs> if the plane is having trouble getting off the ice because it's overloaded, um, the pilot has a couple of options. One is to offload some of the weight of the plane. The other is to try these things, which might get the plane off. Um, they don't like to offload things off the plane because typically we want to get the ice core out or the cargo out or something important has to go out. But there's always this debate inside the airplane. When you try one, I've been on airplanes that have tried 10 or 15 times to get off. And after about 10 tries, you get this kind of sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach because the pilot is going to either try this or he's going to start offloading weight. And you are weight. <laughs> <laughs> and so I frequently, not three, about three or four times in my career, I've been thrown off as an airplane. The next one's coming in about three weeks. Right, so you were ready to leave, you know, you're ready to go home, but uh oh, back we go. We're going to spend, get to spend another three weeks on the ice cream. Planes come about once every three to six weeks, something like that. So you don't, it's not like, you know, every day you get a flight, regular right? schedule stuff. It doesn't work. Anyway, this is a good uh, shot here. On the other hand, flying with the Air Force is fantastic. They are, they're wonderful pilots. They're, they're extremely good. Uh, they once took us down um, through a fjord, literally through a fjord. I don't think we probably had more than 100 feet on either side of the wingtip going down this valley. Ooh. And the pilot just says, no, he goes, no. You know, we're going to let you look out the window. And of course, no one's in a seatbelt, right? You're just hanging on to the cargo. <laughs> it's, it's a totally different way of flying. <laughs> I did tell the students, I, I wasn't going to tell you the story, but I did tell the students, um, it, it's really funny. You, the, 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 the TSA of the military is, is kind of humorous. You walk up to the little uh, elect, the, the machine that, that checks you for metal, the metal detector, and uh, you're asked to take your guns, knives, and bombs out of your pockets. And so and people unload you know, guns, knives, and, and explosives, because you know, they made, we use explosives for recycling purposes. Um, and then you go through the, the uh, metal detector, and then you reach back around and you pick up your guns, knives, and bombs. <laughs> Stick them back in your pocket, off you go on the airplane. They just want to know that you've got a gun or a knife and explosive. They don't really care that you've got an explosive. Because you, know, you are not the only one on the plane with a gun or a knife. <laughs> anyway, all right, so let's talk a little bit about science. Um, the last ice core project we just finished up in Greenland is called Neem or the North Heem Project, uh, which is named after the Heemian. The Heemian is a, uh, um, an old pollen, palynol palynology term for uh, the last summer glacial period. Uh, it's about 120 to 140,000 years ago. It's the last time that the climate on the planet was um, as warm, as fact, it's warmer than today. Uh, and it is our closest analogy in time to a warmer climate. We have not successfully recovered ice from that time period in Greenland because it's right down at the bottom of the ice sheet. And I'll show you the reason why, but when you get to the bottom of the ice sheet, all sorts of funky things happen. Uh, in one location, we had melting going on. 
And in fact, like that Northrop site, we had melting going on, and we actually drilled in and hit water uh, at the base of the ice sheet. And it's not like the <coughs> water is not uncommon at the base of the ice sheet. There's enough ice that accumulates uh, to the point where you get pressure melting at the bottom. There's actually lakes underneath Antarctica. I was on an academy committee that um, basically tried to lay out ground rules for going into the environments that really have we haven't been in for 30, 40 million cubic years, something like that. It's been a long time since they've been exposed. Now. Anyway, a couple of cool things happened in the. I'll show you the signs from there. But one of the things that happened was, and this was our last summer in 2012. Um, all of Greenland had a melting event in uh, on the 12th of July, and uh, we don't. We can actually see melt events in ice cores. You can see the because when it when the when the ice melts. The ice that's formed is clear; it's not bubbly at all. So we can we can actually see these these melt events. And the melt events at this location, and we are I'm sorry, this is not marked. We're way up here at this site. Um, very very rare melt events at this site. You know, maybe a couple of them during the last several thousand years. So this was an in, and we've been seeing more and more melting, but this is the first time we've actually seen melting all over the place. I wasn't up there, but the folks who were there took this picture. I've been on top of the ice sheet many, many times for about 30 years. I've never seen a rainbow because it never rains on the top. They actually had rain at this location. So they're on top of the ice sheet at an elevation of around 13,000 feet, and it's raining on them in July, which is pretty darn amazing. Anyway. Excuse me, what, yeah. was, what was the temperature at that time? Uh, during the daytime? Yes. It was above freezing, slightly above freezing. Just slightly above freezing. Probably about um, one or two degrees C, something like that. Um, it, did, it didn't get, <coughs> wasn't up in the balmy category. It's actually miserable. <coughs> no, seriously, it, it, when it's cold and dry, you know this. I mean, it's, it's actually not so bad. You can handle that. But when it's cold and wet, is when it gets miserable. And this is, I never like being up there when it's cold and wet. It's, it's just miserable. So, why were we going to look at the last era glacial period? A uh, couple of reasons. One is it was warmer than today by a couple of degrees. That is, I pointed out the analogy for the future. But the other important reason why we were after this location is we wanted to see what the ice sheet looked like during the, the last interglacial period. And one of the ways to do that is to recover an ice core that goes through the last interglacial period to give an idea of you know was it a lower ice sheet, uh, was it a bigger ice sheet? We don't. We didn't think it was going to be a bigger ice sheet. We thought it would be a lower ice sheet. Um, this is uh, so. Uh, we were talking about this all day with the students, but uh, there's two ways that we look at climate of the past. One is through paleoclimate, the other is through models, what I call model world, where modelers get together and figure out, okay, this is what I think happened. So the modelers have a whole bunch of models, they run like five or six hundred iterations of this model. This is what they think the Greenland ice sheet looked like during the last interglacial period. This is what their models tell them, given the ocean was warmer, given the atmosphere was warmer. Today, this is one big ice sheet. So there's a, a divide in here that's perhaps no ice at all. There's a southern part and a northern part. And in their world, um, Greenland melted to the tune of about four meters worth of sea level being added to the ocean. And we know that the uh, uh, sea level was about higher by 46 meters at that time. So multiply by three if you want to translate. Um, so the, the sort of conventional wisdom had always been that Greenland um, being much warmer uh, was melting and contributing most of this sea level. And that was really the fundamental hypothesis that we wanted to test was indeed Greenland the spot where this was coming from. Um, we found a couple of things. One is, and I'll, I'll explain what, what's on the figure here. Time is, so oh, I apologize. Paleoclimatologists run time from the left to the right and the right to the left. And we're just sort of ambidextrous that way. So I'm going to challenge you. In this particular one, time runs from here's today, back in time, 120,000 years. We also don't use negative numbers. We, you know, we're not mathematicians. We can't struggle with the concept that time would go positive or negative. Um, anyway, here we are today. This is the, uh, the, the last, our interglacial period, the Holocene. You can see it's a nice, flat, relatively flat, long period of time. We talked about this last night. We've actually enjoyed a very stable climate for about 13,000 years, which has been very beneficial for us as human beings. We were able to develop agriculture and large societies, 
around the climate that really hasn't been all that variable. Uh, go back into the glacial period here, 20,000 years ago to about 100,000 to 80,000 years ago, and you see a couple of things here that are important. I'll come back to these, but uh, you see these ups and downs. And when I first started in ice core science, there was a lot of debate about what these things were. And one of the first things that I did as a, as a postdoc was we measured how fast this last, what's called the Younger Dryas, is cultivated, how fast that ended. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, when we talk about a rough climate change. But you see this is a pretty angry climate. Um, and then we come through a period here, uh, and then we come back out into the last interglacial period. So this is actually the record that we got. I'll show you how we got this. But there's a couple of things you can see. One is that this is considerably warmer than here. It's higher up, and this is measured in a parameter that I'll come back to in a second, the OAT or 16 ratio, the thermometer that we use in, in the ice cream. Um, so here's the change in temperature blown up. This little piece right here goes right here. So here's temperature coming up, uh, crosses, uh, actually zero today, crosses today, and then it goes warmer. It goes warmer by about eight degrees Celsius. So during that time, Greenland was about 8 degrees Celsius, so this location was about 8 degrees Celsius. <coughs> warmer than it is today. Now there's a couple of ways that it can get warmer. One is it could actually be warmer. The second is that the ice sheet could have been much lower. Because if the ice sheet is lower, you're farther down in the atmosphere, and it's warmer as you go down in the atmosphere. Right now this is at roughly 13,000 feet, and so it's cold, both because it's cold and because you're at 13,000. So one of the reasons why it could have been warmer is because the ice sheet was lower. The third reason is uh, we, we can be fooled by the fact that um, there was more summertime snow here. So this particular thermometer only functions when it snows. This is the OAT and 16 ratio of the ice itself. And so unlike thermometers that just sit out there and record 24-7, this one only records when it snows. So if it snowed more in the summertime, we would get a biased warmer temperature. Um, if it snowed more in wintertime, we get a biased Older temperature. So we attacked all of those possibilities in this paper that we wrote. The surface elevation we can get from a couple of measurements that we make. The, most sim the simplest one, but the one that we kind of struggle with at times, is just measuring the total amount of air that's in an ice core. Um, and as you know, as you go up in the atmosphere, you have less atmosphere. And so that was, that was probably our best measure. Now it's not perfect. We argue about that. Um, but we had a couple of ways to attack that. And so this is what we think the elevation history was. It was a little bit lower than today, and somewhere around 124,000 years ago, it was approximately the same as today. It's actually higher by a couple hundred meters. So it only went down by maybe 100 to 200 meters relative to today. All right, so that's important. So, the, so it was warmer, considerably warmer, but the elevation didn't change too much. Now, what that says, it was actually hotter at that time. I mean, we can see that. This part of the ice core is full of melt layers. This part of the ice core has very few, like I said, one or two predominant melt layers. This, the Eni in the last interglacial period was shot full of melt layers. It was much warmer, clearly much warmer at that time. So we had a couple of minutes, a little bit of a conundrum. Um, was Greenland really eight degrees warmer? Actually, this actually is supported by a whole bunch of other data from the Arctic that argues that uh, the Arctic was as much as six, seven, eight degrees warmer than today at that time. Um, it was warmer because of the sun, of the Earth-Sun relationship. We had more insulation, more, sun, more solar energy in the summertime than we do today. Greenhouse gases were approximately the same. So those of you who sat through last night, uh, it wasn't a greenhouse gas warming, it was a solar warming. So you can have all sorts of warming. And this particular one was a solar warming. But the surface elevation didn't change that much, which told us that the ice sheet up in that area, out in that neck of the woods, it's actually pretty much the same as it is today. It's a pretty big ice sheet. Now, what I showed you is the result. Let me show you how we got to the result, because we had to get to it by a lot of machinations. One of the things that we found is that at the bottom of this ice sheet, there's a whole bunch of uh, small topographic features that are probably triggering folding in the ice. The ice is moving along from left to right here. And as it moves along and goes over these bumps and wiggles, you begin to get sort of wave problems. So those of you who sat through geology, you've seen these wonderful features in rocks, the same features you find in ice, only you can't really see them very much. Now, this is a, a um, radio echo, so this is a, uh, we, 
we make uh, noise at the surface and then look to see how the sound waves bounce off and we'll see what we see. Um, this has improved tremendously. That technology has improved tremendously for seeing what's at the bottom of the ice sheet. And it unfortunately improved tremendously from the time that we chose where to go to the time we actually got the ice core. <laughs> so when we, when we chose where the ice core was, we couldn't tell that these kind of features existed near the bottom of the ice sheet because the radio, the, the, uh, the technology wasn't good enough. Now, later on they told us, hey, it looks like there may be folding here. Too. Sorry, we've already built the camp, we've already drilled the ice car. Now you tell us there may be folding here? Indeed, there was a folding there. Uh, and this, on the right-hand side, is the actual record we measured with depth. And on the left-hand side is actually how we put it back together in time. So this is what I just showed you in that other figure. So here's now 100,000 years ago to 130,000 years ago, showing it's cold, and it gets warmer, and it gets warmer. Uh, yeah. um, these two pieces in here are actually inverted. Now, you might ask, how can you tell they're inverted, Jim? Well, there's a lot we can measure in the ice core. And one of the most important things that we can measure in ice cores, which makes ice cores sort of unique from a paleoclimate point of view, is they contain atmosphere. They contain gases in the atmosphere. Uh, just about 10% of the ice is air. Now, because the composition of the atmosphere varies, and because the atmosphere is very well mixed, we can go to a place like Antarctica where we can get this section of ice without any question of hole. We know it's stratigraphically intact. And we can get the record of methane, of CO2, of nitrous oxide, of the isotopes of all of these things. So we can get unbiased records of what the atmosphere should look like. And then we can go to Greenland and we can say, what do we see there? And what we saw was that the only way that this section made sense is if it was inverted because the methane and the methane isotopes were varying over that time period. And the atmosphere doesn't lie. Right? It's because the atmosphere is pretty well mixed, what you see in Antarctica ought to be very, very close to what you see in Greenland. And so we had a way of knowing what the truth was and then unfolding the, the ice that we saw. For those of you who are geology majors, you know you've got to do this anyway. You've got to figure out how to unfold this stuff. Well, we in the ice core business, we're just learning. Um, now I'm going to try my movie player on this. Uh, got to have one failure. This is a little uh, movie that was made by a company in Denmark. And what they did was they had the ice flow, they took it over a couple of photographic features, and then as the, now it's colorized here, but what we think happened is, as the ice is flowing along near the bottom, this is all on the bottom 100 meters of the ice, you get these folds that form that are stripped off the top, the top pieces get torn off, and then you end up with pieces that are flipped over on their side, and here comes our drill. You want this move to the geology? <laughs> so that's what we think happened at this location, and we've got good evidence to show that that was the case, but this was kind of a this was the first time that we had, get, we had a folded ice core and were able to unfold it. And we published this um, just recently in Nature Magazine. So this is the, the, the lesson that we learned from here. I've already talked about some of this. Um, we can reconstruct the, um, what we call the precipitation weighted temperature. So this whole business of summer, winter is working in the background somewhere. Shows a maximum of 8 degrees C warmer than today at 124 to 126,000 years ago. The insulation was higher. So we expected to be warmer, but this was warmer than we had expected, although there are a bunch of other records in the Arctic that support this. And interestingly, Greenland did not contribute more than two meters of sea level rise. So in order for us to be uh, as high as we were at that location, Greenland could not, the Greenland ice sheet could not have been terribly different than it is today. The southern part was probably much smaller, but the northern part was as robust as it is today. And you might ask, well, how is that that possible? Well, one, one reason is you've got a lot of ocean out there. The Arctic Ocean at that time was ice-free, particularly in the summertime. So you had a lot of source water for feeding Greenland snow. And so probably what we think happened was that the ice sheet didn't really change that much because it traded warmth, which was helping to melt it, for additional snowfall coming in off, off the Arctic Ocean. That's the theory that we have right now. But it's relatively clear to us that there's no way we can reconstruct the ice sheet and get more than about two meters sea level rise. So that begs the question, where did the rest of the sea level rise come from? 
And ironically, having worked our tails off in Greenland, we ended up focusing our conclusions on Antarctica. Because Antarctica is the other spot where you've got lots of ice, and the other spot where you can hit sea level rise and come from. So, I showed you the slides last night, it's still flying. Uh, there is, one of the things we do know about our planet is it's a very simple relationship between sea level and temperature. When we have a warmer planet, uh, we have a higher sea level, we have a colder planet, sea level drops. And for two very basic reasons, one is water expands when it's warmer and contracts when it's colder, and also land ice melts. And there's a very powerful reflectivity feedback that as you begin to melt the ice, you get even more uh, uh, heat. So sea level and temperature is easily one of the most robust paleoclimate relationships that we have. When we plot those two things together, we see a very, very strong relationship for very good reasons, very simple physics. Uh, this is an example. Now time is going in the other way. So here's today, going back 400,000 years. And this is sea level. I didn't plot the temperature record on top, top of here. But the temperature record looks pretty much exactly the same. Here's today, our interglacial period. Here's the last interglacial period. There's previous interglacial periods uh, marked with sea level at those times. And you can see a couple of things. One is, you know, our sea level today is just sort of uh, a random number relative to how sea level behaves in the past. 400,000 years ago, sea level was about 20 meters higher than today. Um, 300,000 years ago, it was about the same. Uh, if you go back 200,000 years ago, it was about two meters higher than today. And if you go back, as I pointed out, it's about five to four to six, five to eight, people get different numbers, higher than today if you go back 120,000 years ago. So sea level is, <coughs> is dynamic on the planet. Right? So we know that. And we know it has to be coming from the ice sheet. It's really that much sea level has got to come from Greenland and or Antarctica. That's the only place where you can get that kind of dynamic relationship. This is 20 feet of sea level. That, those words are actually written on the ice sheet. It us <laughs> <laughs> a long time, but we did. Um, but we only got about six feet out of Greenland during the last interglacial period. So the rest of it comes from our good friends to the south. Now this raises some interesting points about the Antarctic ice sheet. So the Antarctic ice sheet is actually two ice sheets. This is the bedrock topography, right? If you look at the actual ice, it's pretty boring. It's a big, white, flat thing, right? um, There's East Antarctica, which is this piece over here, where most of the bedrock is well above sea level. So it's sort of a classic ice sheet. There's the western side, which encompasses all this area over here. And with the exception of some islands out here, most of this is below sea level. And you can't read the, the, the uh, scale here, but it, this is 10,000 feet. <coughs> so that's 10,000 feet below the sea level. Yeah. So it's not just below sea level, the bottom of the ice sheet. It's well below sea level, the bottom of the ice sheet. So the West Antarctic ice sheet is what we call a marine ice sheet, where the bedrock is well below sea level. Marine ice sheets are interesting creatures okay, because the bedrock is below sea level. Now, why does it make them interesting? It makes them interesting because of something called the grounding line. The glaciologists talk about the grounding line. It's the spot where the ice is coming out towards the ocean. In this case, it forms a nice little ice shelf close out in the ocean. But this is where the ice friction against the rock holds the ice so that it can back up behind it. So, you can't really grow ice flows very well. You can't really grow a big ice sheet unless you've got some point in the system that stops the ice from flowing and allows the pressure to back up behind it. So that's the grounding line. Looked at from the side, what this looks like is here's your ice shelf, here's the ocean, and you can see this is well below sea level in here. So you can sort of, here's, here's our grounding line. So you sort of see the grounding line is really critical. If the grounding line disappears, then you've got basically water can get back up underneath here and you lose your control on the ice sheet. It can actually start flowing out into the ocean. Here's an example of um, what we think happens in this situation. Here we have the uh, um, ice shelf coming out, cold water underneath here that's not doing a whole lot of work in melting ice. As the ocean water warms up, it can penetrate up underneath here, then you start really eroding ice sheet. So it turns out that the biggest control on what we think now on the, on, the, on the pinning of these ice sheets is not air temperature, it's water temperature. So what the ocean does in terms of the ocean circulation, what the ocean does in terms of its warmth, and the southern oceans are warming up. 
And so we get warmer and warmer water coming in and eroding this critical little ground water. Now, this is important because, we'll back up for a second, as I pointed out, if we lose this frictional spot, um, ice can start to flow much faster. In Greenland, there's only a couple of places where you can flush ice out from the ice sheet into the ocean. And you can see those from satellite. You can see the, the big ice streams in Jakobsdorf and Fjord, the big ice streams that go north, and I'll show you what that looks like. You can see these things on satellite pictures. You can, in Antarctica, the western part of Antarctica, I'll back up here to make this point, there's a big window right here, a big window right here, and a big window right here where there's really not much stopping the Antarctic ice sheet. If it loses its pinning line there, you have hundreds of miles of open throat, basically, and ice just starts flowing out. And we are, glaciologists are at a point now, this is a wonderful message for you too, we don't know how fast we can put this stuff out. The models simply you know, don't have enough information in order to be able to calculate well just how fast Antarctica can dump ice out into the ocean. Today, sea level is rising at a rate where we'll hit uh, three feet by the end of this century, pretty conservatively. Rates have been a factor of 10, 20, 30 higher in the past. And if the Antarctic ice sheet starts to lose its pinning point and starts to shed ice, it could easily raise sea level rise rates by more than a factor of 10. Easily by more than a factor of 10. Now this is important because three feet in a century is such that most of us are like, you know, okay, you know, I'll talk again about Miami, I'll pick on Miami again, but, um, you know, Miami's kind of toast. Because by 2100, Miami's not a functional city anymore. Um, but 100 years is a long time. Even the folks in Miami don't get excited about 100 years. If it's happening 10 times faster, then 100 years shrinks down to a couple of decades. A couple of decades is the time frame on which we build and finance homes, on which we build and finance air conditioning systems, in which we build and finance sewage treatment plants. That becomes a societally interesting number. Maybe 20 years sounds like a lot to you if you're 21, 22 years old, but trust me, when you sign that mortgage one of these days for a 30 year loan, you know, you're getting, you get an impression of what 30 years is like. And if, if you build up, if you buy a home and you expect within 30 years that home to be no longer functional because sea level's risen and takes your home away, then you know this is a bad investment. So, up, uh, in, see what else works on this one. This is a little animation from NASA I'm just showing the speed. So the reds here are um, fast flowing ice and the uh, blues are slower flowing ice. But you see this very large area here on the Rossi shelf of very rapidly flowing ice. Uh, this is, these are actually reconstructed ocean currents using satellite observations. The area that we're really interested in today happens to be this area out here called Pine Island. So along here you have very rapidly flowing ice in here today because you have very warm ocean currents that are getting up underneath you. The other side of it, what's called the Rosie Fisher Ice Shelf, also has very, very rapid flowing ice. I had to show this because NASA spent a buttload of your tax dollars putting it together. Question? Yeah. If, if, if sea level, or just if sea temperatures are, are warming, we need it enough to force some of that ice out. You know, and if we really flush a lot of ice out, that in turn could cool the water. Yeah, a little bit. So how how is it all? <laughs> how does it all play out? Well, um, if you take a, a look at the you know the, the Southern Ocean, uh, it's there's not nearly enough ice to, to battle. There's a lot of heat mass in the water. Uh, question? Yeah. I don't quite get the idea of a grounding why because of yeah. what this is a physics problem. Actually, the ice sheet feeds the bottom. 
Because any crud that accumulates on the ice sheet, then when it comes down and melts, it dumps it at its grounding level. So there's actually a self-perpetuating process that the ice sheet keeps adding crud there. So what's happening today is not only is it getting warmer, but with sea level rising, it's actually lifting up that little chunk of the ice as well. So both of those things are happening. It's mostly warm ice. Is that okay? Yeah. When you say the ice sheet is moving rapidly, how fast is it? Ice moves at you know, 40, 50, 60 meters a year. Um, there are places where, where you just saw that, that video. You can set out a, a row of flags across some of those large areas, you know, 50 miles across. And in a matter of a couple of days, you can see that the ones in the middle are moving much faster than the ones on the edge. Okay. So it's physically pretty quick. It's quick. You can see it. Oops, sorry. So the question is not if sea level will rise in a warmer climate. But really, we're, we're focusing in on these two questions. How fast and how far? So how fast can the ice? We don't know the answer to number one. We know that it's faster than today. And the real question is, is will it be fast enough for us as societies to really care about that? Because right now, with 100 years <coughs> lifetime from Miami, we don't really care so much. So if it's a 20 years lifetime from Miami, I think people might begin to care. And the second question is, how far? So how far will sea level rise? If Antarctica goes, how, how high up does sea level go? It's not going to reach three feet by 2100 to stop there. Okay. So I showed you this last night. Sea level is rising today by uh, about a meter by the end of the century. It's not going to stop there. Uh, and this is without West Antarctica collapsing. So no one, none of the three feet, the one meter does not include any problems with West Antarctica. This is what I showed last night. Miami really doesn't have much of a future beyond the end of this century. This is a city that, you know, as I pointed out last night, you could go on business on a boat, you could go tarpon fishing, you can go boat fishing, a lot of stuff. Um, so you can ask a simple question in terms of the how far. The simple question you can ask is, uh, what was the climate like last time we had roughly 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere? Thinking, okay, under that condition, um, what happened? You know, were the, was West Antarctica gone? The answer was yes, West Antarctica was gone. So how high was sea level? And the Pliocene, about 3 million years ago, is the last time we think the CO2 levels were around 350 to 400 parts per million. We're 390 something today. You've got to go back a long way in time to find the Earth of today. It's about 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the Arctic for trees right up to the edge of the Arctic Circle at that time. There was certainly less sea ice and there was less land ice. And sea level was pretty robustly somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 meters higher than today. So what's the 20 to 25 meters of sea level look like? And, I, and by the way, from a paleo climate point of view, so we conclude from this that if we let the system sit for a long enough period of time, you know, maybe several hundred years, it will go up roughly 20 to 25 meters higher sea level. That sort of is the simple answer to the question of how high will it go. And we don't know any, any, there's no mechanism we can think of that stops it and says, okay, I'm sorry, this time around because human beings are here, we're only going to go up 10 meters. We'll let the scientists decide. No, nature's going to decide. Um, the number of plots that look like this, but this is uh, instructive. This is the global mean temperature plotted against sea level. And what you can see is, again, on our planet, so we can put a whole bunch more points on here. On our planet, you've got a very robust relationship between when you have a warmer planet, you've got higher sea level. When you've got a colder planet, you've got lower, colder planet, you've got lower sea level. About 20,000 years ago, it was about 11 degrees colder, about 120 meters lower sea level. Um, here's the Pliocene point I just showed you, I just talked about. This is when Antarctica was totally melted out. Sea level was about 80 meters higher than today. And this is the last interglacial period here. This, by the way, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change forecast for temperature for 2100. And there's no reason that we can see why this is just going to go this way and not this way. This point is actually not on the line. It's a tiny, tiny bit above the line. So it's really a question of time. You've got to let the system have time, and it will eventually melt the ice off. So we expect, if indeed we warm right around this area, we expect to be up around the supply scene level in terms of sea level in the future. So let's have some fun. Right? <laughs> Relatively grim, so far. let's have some fun. So what happens when the world with 20 meters of sea level rise? All right. Thank you, Google, because you can go in and do this yourself. Right? You can go in and actually. You know, we have got enough good topographic material, thanks to the U.S. Geological Survey and thanks to Google. This is Delaware. 
with uh, 20 meters of sea level rise. Delaware is no longer with us. <laughs> now, good students of the state of Delaware, what was the first state of the Union? Delaware. Delaware signed first. On their license plate, it says first state of the Union. There's beauty in here. <laughs> first in, first out. Okay. You gotta have some humor involved in this. Right? So here's Delaware. We're down to 49. Delaware is the first one to exit. Right? First one in, first one out. Okay. It's also where the first Swedish colony in America was founded in the 1600s. And thank goodness they moved west. <laughs> you know, thank goodness they settled around here. Um, the, the, uh, we talked about this today with students, the number one agency, the number one U.S. federal agency when it comes to spending on climate change is not the National Science Foundation, it's not NOAA, it's not NASA, it's the Department of Defense. It's our Pentagon, because they know that stuff like this is coming. They know that there will be refugees, and they know that these things don't sort themselves out elegantly. So they spend a lot of money doing scenario planning for this kind of situation. Right? This is a problem with that. There's, a, there's hundreds of millions of people here, and this country over here, which is uh, India, is not going to welcome them with open arms, and this country over here is not going to welcome them with open arms. They don't particularly like each other. Right? So, climate refugees are a reality for our future. Yeah, India has already built a fence to keep the Bangladesh from coming in. Good luck with that. <laughs> There's some interesting spots, and you know, this is the uh, the Great Valley of California. There's all sorts of tomatoes and strawberries and uh, all sorts of stuff underwater under this area. 20 meters of sea level, so you can guarantee that we're going to build a dam right there in the Carquinas area. You know, we got a dam coming right there. By the way, um, so when I when I so I give I talk in Colorado, I live in Colorado. One of the uh, <coughs> interesting features of this area down in here is this is Oakland's a pretty low-lying area. And so Oakland Alameda County Stadium, which is where the Oakland Raiders play football, <laughs> is gone. <laughs> <laughs> when I give the talk to a bunch of Broncos fans, everybody he runs. <laughs> Um, so here's Florida, here's Louisiana. I, this breaks my heart because I, I love Louisiana. I love the culture there. But those folks have got to move. Hopefully they take the food and the culture with them. <laughs> here's Florida. Florida, so we are spending billions of dollars fixing the Everglades today. Billions of dollars fixing the Everglades today. And it's hopeless. I mean, the Everglades is toast by the end of this century, and they're definitely going to be underwater in the future. Here's a, a, key, a key piece of information here. What's really important right here? Disney World. Disney World. World. You were close. I'll give you a B. <laughs> Disney World is right here. Turns out that with 20 meters of sea level rise, the Disney princess can sail right up here or down the Jacksonville River right to the Magic Kingdom. Right? So Disney's going to make out like a man. Disney does not play. Well, it's not a single block, you know, Disney's got to figure it out. What I'd like to tell my students is, follow the money. Who makes out like a bandit under climate change? Disney. <laughs> so who's behind climate change? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you come to your own. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to spend about, I'm sorry, I took too much time. I'll spend about two minutes talking about it, climate change and then we'll take questions. Um, so for climate change, I'll just move on here. <laughs> when I was a graduate student, our view of climate change was driven by changes in the sun. And changes in the sun are slow. Thousands of years it takes for uh, the sun to change. There's a precession of the orbit, a of the orbit, a concentricity of the orbit. And this says in words what I was trying to say in the previous thing. In general, solar changes are slow. Thousands of years. So when I was a graduate student, when I learned about climate change, was that it took thousands of years to go from a glacial state to an interglacial state. And it took thousands of years to go from an interglacial state to a glacial state because it's all driven by the sun, Jim. Did you get that? Okay. So now we got interested in this um, when I was a postdoc. Uh, some very smart people 
in uh, Copenhagen said, let's measure this core down here, which has very high accumulation rate, and see if we can measure on a year-by-year -year basis 13,000 years ago, which was the last time we had a big abrupt climate change. So it turns out there's enough accumulation in this location. You can actually see layers of snow that are about this thick that are 13,000 years old. 13,001, 13,002, 13,003, 13,004. You get the picture, right? So you actually go in and measure on a year-by-year -year basis what was happening there. This is, well, we're going to skip over all this stuff. This is the context. This is the period we were looking at. This is about 13,000 years ago. There's a bunch of these things. I pointed that out before. Time is now actually going to tear in that direction. There's a bunch of these abrupt changes. And this was the first time back in the late 80s when we actually took a look at this and said, are these things real? Are they real changes? This is my good buddy, Willie Dansgaard, who since passed away. So this is a paper we published in 89 that showed that uh, a 15 degree Celsius change occurred in about 50 years. So when I started my college career lecturing to students, I would tell them that 15 degree changes happened in a couple thousand years. And their eyes would roll in the back of their head like sharks, like, you know, give me something I care about. <laughs> when I told them it was 50 years, I thought 50 years was, you know, I could really get excited about it. Now, as it turns out, there are other pieces of it that happened in 20 years. I still couldn't get their attention. Now, I'm going to tell you that there are parts of this system, we've now dug into this even more, where you can get 5 degrees Celsius change, very large change, in less time than it takes to get through college. Does that get your attention? Right. And trust me, the folks at Colorado are tough, because unless it's next Friday, which is their time scale of interest, they're not going to get excited about it at all. <laughs> So here's an example. This is the, again, the younger guys. We've now measured a bunch of stuff. It turns out it's about a 10 degree C increase in Greenland temperature. We're off by a little bit. The snow doubled. It was cruising along at a certain level. And then in one to three years, it doubled accumulation and stayed there for the next 12,000 years. So accumulation goes in, boink. In one to three years, it changed. So there was a sea ice retreat in one to two years. Methane went up in, by 50% in 50 years. Methane is controlled by tropical wetlands. So it was a global feature that was going on. A lot of things were happening. <coughs> 10 degrees C is Atlanta to Minneapolis. Right? 12 degrees C is Mobile to Minneapolis. <coughs> so you're talking about a climate change that would take you from Mobile, Alabama to Minneapolis. Does that get your attention? There's a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to dwell on this. You can see we've actually measured. A no we have a number of different thermometers we can measure. These things range anywhere from 12 and a half degrees to 10 degrees. Excuse me. Yeah. Is there evidence of, of massive species extinction that, that, that correlates with those events? There are species extinctions that correlate with those events. Yes. There are always species extinctions. What I'm talking about is if you have a 10 degree Celsius increase mm -hmm. over a period of just a couple of years, you're going to lose a lot of species. Let me come back to that. OK. OK. I'll come back to that. So <clears throat> one of the questions we asked was, are these things real? And since that first paper, we found that indeed they are. This is now two ice cores, one here and one down here. So it's separated by a pretty good distance. In blue, you see one of them. In red, you see the other. And, even, and these are years, 50 years, 50 years. So each of these points is actually a year. So you can actually see the year-by-year -year changes correlate from one spot and another spot across the room. Uh, and, and what I think is even cooler is the uh, we've now measured enough of these things that we can see that the this warming was, instead of being 50 years, was actually a step, a plateau, and a step. And each of these steps is about one degree C per five years, plateaus, and then one degree C per five years. One degree C per five years, just to kind of help you remember this, is about 100 times larger than the warming that's occurred in the last century. We've seen about a degree in 100 years. This is about a degree per year. This is. So roughly half of the distance climatologically from Alabama to Minnesota happening in the time it takes you to get through college. And then when your younger sister comes along and goes, she gets the rest of it. So that's, finally I was getting the interest and attention of my students. Um, there were parts of the system that are even faster. I'm not going to try to explain what the QMX measures, but this is our, what we measure in every ice core that shows us that there is an ocean trigger to this event. Ocean conditions and atmospheric conditions change, and they change very, very rapidly. 
one to two years. And this has been doing this for thousands of years, and then this does this for thousands of years. Okay. And so what I'd like to tell my students is, you know, when your parents, every parent tells every child, when I was your age, I used to have to walk through the snow, uphill, both ways, and you know, kids would always roll their eyes and the parents go, come on, Dad, it really wasn't that bad, right? Well, there really was a time, it's a probably a collective memory, right? There really was a time when one generation had to deal with fundamentally different climate than the next generation. So there really was a time when a father or a wife or a mother said to their children, when I was your age, it was much, much colder, and we had to walk through snow. It wasn't uphill both ways. That's totally wrong. But it really was. So there really was a time in um, there. You know what? I'm going to stop there because we're out of time. Uh, and we can talk. I was going to show you some cool stuff about how you pull a dome around on the ice sheet, but uh, we can maybe talk about that. Uh, but I do want to leave some time for questions, and I apologize for John. So I will wrap it up here, and I'll thank you so much for your kindness, for all the stuff you've done for me over the last couple of days. And uh, for the students, yes, I'm going to get Chuck up at 4 a.m. He's going to take videos. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>